The Armchair First memories are typically cloudy and hard to conjure. Delicate wisps of smoke that fade upon scrutiny. While some are vague but sincere flashes triggered by associations in the present. Others are pure fabrication, false images produced by an overactive imagination. My first memory is clear and profoundly vivid though. Two figures carrying an armchair into our house. Its outline illuminated by a corona of afternoon sunlight. Mum has always denied the legitimacy of this supposed recollection, claiming the piece of furniture in question had been acquired around the time I was born. He couldn't possibly remember that far back, she asserted, to which my father simply shrugged. Regardless of whether my remembrance is genuine, the object has always been an intrinsic feature of our living room. It inhabits its position perfectly, without taking up an inch of unnecessary space. Its colour, a neutral light grey, does not hold one's gaze for long, and it seems to have been fashioned from the hardiest leather known to man. During the armchair's uncertain yet unquestionably long lifespan, it has not borne so much as a tiny scuff or scratch. It's endured several renovations, variations of colour schemes, countless waves of refurnishing, holding its position in the room with complete conviction and belonging. Another persistent quality is the curious way it demands single ownership. As a small child, I distinctly remember it being my father's armchair. On returning from work, he'd lure himself onto it, remaining there until my mother ushered him into bed. This was the chair upon which he drank himself into an early grave. His alcoholism is something I've only recently come to accept, despite my grandma always cursing him for it. I'm too mad to grieve. The damned fool pickled his liver, she famously remarked at the funeral, clearly hoping we'd all agree. But for all his faults, laziness perhaps being the most prominent, he was never abusive or even irritable. Truth be told, the man was a cheerful drunk, prone to telling jokes and occasionally breaking into song. With him gone, the chair sat empty for perhaps a month, then my mother reluctantly took his place. She was never the same after he died. Within 18 months she developed what I now understand to be a crippling addiction to pain medication. After serving dinner, she'd swallow a handful of tablets, collapse onto the chair, and remain there until long after my sister and I had gone to bed, engrossed by trashy novels and obscure crosswords, a serene yet spaced out expression plastered across her face. My one regret is that we didn't notice it sooner, that by the time we appreciated the extent of her physical deterioration, it was too late. One Friday night her breathing suddenly seemed laboured, her complexion a ghostly grey. The following morning we awoke to discover that she hadn't managed the short walk to her bedroom. I desperately tried to get a response, immediately finding her skin cold to the touch. It was directly after this that Amelia declared that the chair was cursed, an assertion that I, at 12 years old, found all the more absurd and immature from a sister nearly four years my senior. With the house paid off by mum's life insurance, grandma moved in, ostensibly to look after us. It soon became clear that this was not a role she took literally, however. The woman was a television addict who barely lifted a finger leaving all the cooking and cleaning to the two of us. Well, mostly to Amelia, if I'm honest. Day after day, the old woman would recline in the armchair, transfixed by whatever mindless melodrama was playing out on screen. Until one evening we noticed that one side of her body had fallen completely limp. Amelia, then almost 18, quickly recognised that the old woman had suffered a stroke. Evidently, it was a significant one because she did not survive the journey to the hospital. Once more, the armchair stood empty, and my sister demanded that we dispose of it. But it's in perfect condition, I couldn't help arguing. The thing was pristine, 
despite being the oldest piece of furniture in the room, it strangely seemed the newest, and upon taking measurements, I discovered that its dimensions were perfect for the little recess in which it resided. After trawling the internet for weeks on end, I could find no appropriate replacement. So the armchair stayed, and we ditched the three-seater Chesterfield instead. Amelia picked out a comfortable corner sofa, which she immediately claimed the left side of, as this was in direct eyeline with the TV. My side was not, and after a few weeks my neck began to ache. All the while the well-positioned armchair appeared to call out to me, its glossy surface glowing under the light. Each day the thought crossed my mind of just giving in, of accepting the siren call and ignoring my inane and superstitious sibling. It felt ridiculous to resign myself to chronic discomfort because of her strange delusions. But she continued to reference the curse, and I continued to give in to her. That thing is evil, she would snap whenever she caught me peering at the chair. Everyone who sat in it has died. And today I woke up in agony, with each spasm an electric jolt ran down my neck. On finding that the pain medication offered no relief whatsoever, I decided something must be done. We need to reevaluate the seating arrangement. I texted Amelia from school. Easy fix, she replied. Get rid of the armchair. I tutted and slammed my phone down on the cafeteria table. She was insufferable. Even though we'd both gone through the same hardships, I hadn't lost my ability to be rational. I readied myself for an argument on my walk home. But when I entered the house, I found myself lost in a daydream, strangely unaware of my own actions. I turned on the TV and paused for a moment. For the first time in days, weeks even, I felt no pain or discomfort in my neck. Then I froze, realizing where I was sitting. Amelia entered the house a few minutes later. When she appeared in the living room, her backpack dropped to the ground with a thud. How could you? She was screaming. How could you? 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 Suddenly I didn't recognize the eyes glaring back into mine. What had always been hazel now appeared black and inhuman. She leapt forward, pinning me to the chair. Taller and stronger as she was, I barely offered any resistance. As her hands wrapped around my neck and started to squeeze, a vivid image appeared in my mind. Two figures carrying an armchair into our house, its outline illuminated by a corona of afternoon sunlight. But the sunlight turned to flames, which momentarily flared, radiating an ancient kind of evil. Then everything slowly faded away. Thank you for making it all the way to the end. If you enjoyed it, tell your friends. Your support is massively appreciated. 